everyone. My name is Teddy, and welcome to part two of re-redesigning the Winx Club. Well, technically we're doing Charmix designs. If you haven't watched part one, definitely go check it out first for a more in-depth explanation. But basically, these are the versions of these characters from my rewrite. It's season two and they're going to Earth, and Charmix will be functioning as a little magical boost while they're away from home. Last time we did Bloom, Stella, and Flora, and I couldn't wait to finish the rest of the girls, so let's jump right in. My Tecna was born in Zenith City, a tiny, fragile baby with lots of health issues. Growing up, she spent lots of time at the on-campus hospital at Alfea, to the point where Headmistress Farragonda just gave her her own permanent room there. She and Farragonda grew quite close, actually, and Tecna even becomes her apprentice. That means one day she'll be taking over as Guardian Fairy of Alfea Library, and likely become the headmistress of the school, too. When the story begins, Tecna is a bit embarrassed about her position with the school, she doesn't want to be seen as getting special treatment or as somebody who'll go running to Farragonda about every little thing. So she tells everyone that her actual title is Fairy of Information. Techna's fairy powers give her an incredible memory, and she has a fantastic talent for analysis and problem solving. During her many stays at the hospital, she likely spent far more time at the school's extensive library than she did at her parents' house. Alfia is home to the largest, oldest, and most thorough treasure trove of knowledge in the entire world. Think Library of Alexandria times a magical hundred. In that time, Tecna read through more books than you or I could keep track of, but she remembers each one. She's full of fun facts about anything you could imagine and just loves learning more. One of her favorite things to learn about is computers and technology in that kind of vein. She enjoys building them and playing with specs and other computer stuff that I definitely don't know enough about to get into. <laughs> At the end of season one, Murda will transfer to Alfia, and Farragonda will take her under her wing as sort of a pseudo-fairy apprentice, guiding her in a similar way she did with Bloom when she first arrived as well. I think that once Murda is at Alfia, Tecna will offer for her to stay in her old room at the hospital, and the two will develop a sisterly kind of bond. Then one day, when Tecna is the new Farragonda, Murda will be the new Griselda, the trusted second-in-command. I like the idea of Tecna developing all different kinds of relationships she's never had before throughout the story. She keeps her herself pretty isolated a lot of the time and always has, often feeling weak or sick from her chronic illness and preferring to sit inside in the dark on her computer. <laughs> Relatable. She's an only child and was homeschooled, so she just didn't do much socializing, which scares her as a concept pretty badly at first, but eventually she comes to cherish it dearly. A best friend, a boyfriend, a surrogate sister, a whole friend group. Never did she think she would be part of a club like this, but it's nice. For this version of Tecna, she's still pretty thin, but not quite as thin as before, I think. She does still get sick, but as she gets older, she's better at understanding her body and managing her health. I can imagine Timmy is a good cook, often making sure she's eaten something despite her lack of appetite, and even coming up with good tasting recipes that don't hurt her stomach. Tecna's fairy form is a hard one for me. The kind of sleek sci-fi vibe I want for it is very removed from the kind of designs and fashion that I'm familiar with. I knew I wanted her in a skin-tight bodysuit with big statement shoes, but the actual details of the look were still up in the air. My mood board was kind of all over the place. I liked this keyhole I added to her first design that I did for her, but I don't think the shape really did anything for the look. For the re-redesign, I wanted to make the shape match the gem on her forehead and incorporate the same shape throughout the design. You'll see I did try out another design for her top. I was thinking maybe I could have the hood connect to the arm socks and make it like a shrug, so that way we could still have that open neckline. But something about it was a little awkward. I think Techno's fairy form works well as a full body spandex style catsuit that we can then add accessories on top of. For example, I liked that I gave her knee pads in that first design and I added one to her new design too. Since her Charmix is a hip holster that goes to the left, I thought having something on her right leg would balance it out. Plus, if she's doing a lot of sliding or falling on her knees, she would probably tend to favor one side over the other, so it kind of makes sense. Techno's Charmix was a difficult one to come up with inspiration for. There are a lot of directions one could go for it, but I wanted it to match with the other vessels, which are all in glass vials of some kind. A lot of the references I looked at for Bloom, Stella, and Flora's Charmix were antique perfume bottles, so I eventually decided for Techna I would use a modern refillable 
refillable perfume bottle as inspiration. This would be a great time for a scent bird sponsor, wouldn't it? I wish. <laughs> Anyways, I think this kind of sleek metal tube is actually somehow perfect for being what Techna would come up with for holding her Charmix. It almost feels like it would have some kind of like serum in a Marvel movie or something. <laughs> You know what I mean? There's just one issue with the shape. It looks, in this cartoonified form, a little bit too much like, yeah. But I thought it was a bit too small anyways, so I made the middle part of the casing rounder, giving it a shape like a stretched out UFO or something. <laughs> so it's a shiny metal exterior encompassing a glass vial, so it's still in there. I just loved the idea of her Charmix being in a harness. Every time I try to look up some kind of tech wear, it's just strap city over here. And I think the utility of it is perfect for Techna. So, okay, pause. I finished Techna's design for this video and I just didn't like it. I was going for a catsuit vibe where her whole outfit was tight and aerodynamic, like I said, and then she puts the accessories on top. Oh, I, I don't know. I wanted her shoes to be part of her pants, but also for them to be chunky, but also for them to feel sleek and techno. The whole thing was just confused. I also wanted to incorporate the sheer elements I had in the first three designs, and by adding it to her sleeves, it made her top feel too much like active wear, I think, like she's gonna go for a jog. I didn't change her wings very much from her first design, I think they're a fine way of adapting the unique wings she has in the original show to fit my rewrite. All I really did was make them a bit more green and a little bit bigger. I do really love the gliders she can turn her wings into in the original. Maybe I can come up with a way for her to manifest it alongside her normal fairy wings for some kind of boost when flying. Maybe it can even be like suggested or inspired by Timmy and his planes. I did always think the glider kind of looked like a paper airplane a little bit. There were some elements from that first design I did like. Well, I guess second, first Charmix design, the one you just watched. For example, her having a hood. Of course, I liked the harness and I like it on her thigh. It feels tactical and I like the asymmetry of it, but something about the waist belt just sits really awkwardly on the design. I do like the single knee pad I gave her though. After a few days of looking at the design, I decided it just didn't sit right with me and I went back and changed some things. I adjusted the size and positioning of her legs a bit so she feels a bit more natural and stable. Then, with a fresh batch of references, I started again. I reminded myself that her fairy form can still feel streamlined without being a fancy morph suit, so I changed it to being a bodysuit over sheer tights, and I like that the keyhole is part of the structure of the garment now, not just random feeling. I brought back the shrug idea from way before. The bulkier sleeves match with with the hood, but the tighter parts past her forearms bring back in the rest of the outfit. I think fingerless gloves go nicely with the tactical feeling of all her straps, and I like seeing a little more of her skin peeking through. Her shoes are so much better now. They incorporate the colors and shapes of the rest of her design in a way that I think really ties it all together and makes it feel balanced. I even tried to mimic the shape of her shoes from the show by making them almost heelless heels. I also love the changes to her belts and harnesses. I think they are much more flattering and even feel more secure. Plus, I gave her a little pocket shaped like the ones for flip phones that used to be on everything as a little nod to her originally being the fairy of technology in 2004. Oh, her knee pad is metal now to match her Charmix. I don't know how actually useful that would be, but it looks cool. <laughs> In her fairy form, Tecna has slicked back hair, which I love. When she isn't a fairy, she has a sort of Audrey Hepburn slash Mia Farrow kind of cut, and I think it's so cool how different the vibe is when it's slicked back. Honestly, even with the new better look, her hair might be my favorite part of the whole design somehow. I just really like it. All right, time for Musa. Before we get into it, I wanted to do a little YouTuber blurb where I ask you to like and subscribe if you're enjoying my content. I'm trying to get more serious about this channel, and if more people join our party, that means I can make more content for you. Rewriting an entire TV show is a lot of work. Okay, once again, I am watching back the first videos I made for the girls in preparation for their re-redesigns. Luckily, the audio doesn't sound too bad in this one. Fitting for a music-based fairy. Oh, please ignore the fact that the unrevised Tecna is there for this design. For once, I actually cared about their heights making sense and brought her in as reference like I did in part one with Bloom and Stella. But, uh, yeah, she looked like that. Wow, it is so bad compared to the new one. <laughs> 
Musa is a city girl who thrives in the hustle and bustle of urban life. She was born in Melody City, the entertainment capital of Solaria. Her mother was a singer while her father managed her performances, and Musa was well acquainted with the world of show business from a young age. She's the kind of person that feels at home on the stage, a natural-born performer. She can even play multiple instruments, her favorite being guitar and, of course, her voice. Unfortunately, when Musa was younger, her mother passed away, and afterwards, she and her father moved back to Yuan Village, where he grew up. Musa did not appreciate the change and struggled to adapt to the slower pace of the region's small farming towns. The best part of this new lifestyle was the trips back to Melody to drop off goods. Seeing the lights of the city in the distance was a relief like no other. I felt the same way when I hit the city on my six to eight hour drives home from college. As she got older, Musa started to do these deliveries on her own, and she soon looked forward to seeing more than just the city lights. She developed a friendship with the daughter of one of the shop owners on her route, a feisty, rebellious girl with a dream of becoming a household name. She wasn't exactly sure how, but you know what? I bet you've heard of her. The Witch of Illusions, Darcy. By age 17, they had become more than friends and were even talking about going to Cloud Tower together and studying witchcraft. When Musa suddenly manifested an unexpected pair of fairy wings, Darcy felt betrayed by this and when Musa decided to attend Alfia, she ended their relationship completely. Musa was heartbroken, but a hopeless romantic through and through and by the time her first day on campus came around, she was ready to start fresh, hoping to meet the love of her life in this new place. After meeting Riven, she sort of decides that he is going to be the one for her, but he just doesn't seem to reciprocate her advances. Turns out he's already got his eyes on a cool witch he met at the commencement gala held by the three schools at the beginning of the academic year. It isn't until after he and Darcy break up when the tricks reveal their plans with Dark Art at the end of season one of this rewrite that Riven begins to see Musa as a potential romantic partner. Actually, it's seeing her on the battlefield that gives him that spark, which makes sense since their relationship to come would be defined by fighting. Eventually, Musa and Riven break up for good and find they work much better that way. As badly as she wants to find love, it's never good to have to force it. Little does she realize there's someone who's been pining for her for months, someone with whom her relationship grew organically and she already knows and trusts with her whole heart. I'm sure most of you know how much I love this ship already, but yes, Musa's and game partner is Aisha. They are so cute. Musa doesn't find out her fairy title until after she begins attending Alfia. She is the guardian fairy of Melody City. I imagine her as the most classic kind of guardian fairy in charge of protecting and helping a major population center. Most guardian fairies are probably something along this line, as opposed to protecting a sacred garden or the dragon's flame. But Musa loves Melody and is honored and thrilled to be its guardian fairy. Because of the music and theater that is ingrained into the city's culture, this is what Musa's powers connect to. As Fairy of Melody, Musa will eventually become sort of like a celebrity to the city. The fairies that have been its protector in the past have usually been incredibly talented musicians, and often their position grants them a level of stardom that then they can embrace or expand if they so choose. This is like a dream come true for Musa, and it means that she's probably going to be living in Melody for the rest of her life. Also a dream come true. There are a lot of couples in Winx Club, and most of them are pretty stable and sweet, but there's gotta be at least one where we can get our fix of juicy drama. Musa is a hopeless romantic, big time, so she's kind of the perfect character to saddle with the tumultuous love life. Even before the story begins, she has a mysterious ex that she can't help but to allude to in conversation. Then when the group meets the specialists, she fixates on the bad boy of the group whose attention she just can't seem to hold, not for lack of trust. After the tricks go full mask off villains, Musa finds herself fighting alongside Riven against Darkar's shadow creature army and in the chaos of war, the sparks finally begin to fly. During the battle, they work together like a well-oiled machine, but in the mundanity of everyday life, they've begun to break down. I would definitely have it that by the end of season two, they've broken up for good. And listen, the original show, it's just every member of the Winx has their guy that was created for them to be paired with. It makes it feel so weirdly 
unnatural sometimes. I think Musa and Aisha have a chemistry that can easily progress from best friends to partners with a deep understanding and trust between them. Musa's Charmix form is the only one from this video I didn't tweak 5 million times. <laughs> but I did tweak it a little bit after the speed draw ends, so you'll see that in the final looks. I was actually pretty happy with the original one I gave her, like the Magic Weeks form from forever ago. I liked the tights and the big combat boots, but it is a little too edgy teen and just doesn't quite hit her personality right. Like, yes, she is an edgy teen, but she's also more than that. I put the sheer piece over her midriff for this one, like in the original cartoon, as well as over the boob windows. I wanted to incorporate a lot of little metal hardware pieces in this look, so that's why there's safety pins and studs and stuff all over the place. She has her purple armbands still. If you remember, I actually made the ribbon something she started wearing while dating Darcy, who wore one as a choker too, but I like the idea of her repurposing it to represent her new best friends. I mean, Tecna's main color color is purple, and you'll see how it connects to Aisha when we get to her design. Speaking of colors, for the first design I did for Musa, I made her outfit this weird pink color because I was trying to use her fairy form to make the bi flag, but I really missed her being in just straight up red. I went for a bit more of a rock and roll angle to her edginess this time, so that's why she has these shiny platform heel boots instead of the other ones. It was really hard trying to simplify the shine of polyurethane. That's one of the things I tweak later. I changed the kind of headphones she wears to a more vintage feeling design. I don't know, I guess I just personally associate them more with music production than consumption for some reason. Maybe it's because they remind me of the Telex headsets I used to wear when I did technical theater in high school makes it feel more behind the scenes or something. But I really like that they're gonna end up matching her Charmix in a pretty cool way. Her Charmix vessel is probably the most unique out of all six of them, but I couldn't resist the idea of making it look like some kind of portable music player. I looked at a lot of different kinds from the past few decades, and her original Charmix reminds me of a portable CD player, but for my version, I took more inspiration from the Walkman of the 80s. There's still a little glass bottle in there, okay? It's just like in a leather case that she can pop open to access it. One more thing about this Musa is that I made her a bit chubbier than my original design, and she is going to stay that way. My thinking is that she's kind of taken on stress eating a bit due to the on again, off again state of her relationship and just growing up. And it would be something she struggles with at first because she worries it'll make her less beautiful in Riven's eyes. It does not, by the way. In fact, he barely even notices. As time goes on and she gets with Aisha, she will start to accept and then love her body again. Of course, another person's validation shouldn't make or break one's body image, but sometimes, you know, it makes a difference. And for Musa, having a partner that is completely and utterly enchanted by her goes a long way. In my rewrite, Aisha will be joining the Winx at the end of season one. If this was really a cartoon, she would have been a consistent background character up until this point, sharing some classes with the girls or just being seen around campus. Ugh, if this was really on TV, I can imagine the theories people would come up with as they start to notice her. How fun would that be? Ugh, that's my dream as an artist. Have people theorizing about a cartoon I make. <laughs> Anyways, I imagine she encounters Bloom in the library a few times, with Bloom of course being kind of suspicious that this random girl is also looking for obscure texts about Lord Darkar. Eventually, she confronts her, being Bloom, thinking maybe she's working alongside the tricks or something, but Aisha emphatically assures her she wants to take him down as well. And that she hasn't only been looking for books on Darkar, but also on a strange magical substance called Morphix. Aisha had been gifted the power to wield Morphix shortly before she came to Althea, after witnessing the destruction of the Pixie Village by Darkar. As Princess of Andros, Aisha spent a lot of her time on her own, and found herself quite lonely after her favorite ballet instructor retired. Her daughter Anne would often come to Aisha's classes, and up until that point, the young princess had considered the girl her best friend. In my original video for Aisha, I have her find out about the Pixies from a book, and then seek them out over the course of a few months 
dance. But I think I prefer the idea of her finding them accidentally. Just like with the other girls, I did watch the old video and there's actually a few differences between my first telling of her time in the village and this one. So if you notice any inconsistencies, just assume I'm aware and it's been retconned. <laughs> one night, alone in her chambers, she had decided to sneak out and go for a late night swim in a small lake she had discovered on the castle grounds. At the bottom of the lake, she noticed a strange pink shimmer. And as she dove deeper, it became clear that this lake had a false bottom. As the fairy of waves, she was able to manipulate this strange substance just enough to pass through it, only to emerge on the other side in free fall. Catching herself midair, she looked at what appeared to be an entire secret city and everything was miniature. When Aisha first stumbled into the pixie village, they were very frightened to have an outsider amongst them. They kept their society hidden for a reason, as many magical creatures seemed quite fond of the taste of pixie. But after meeting their matriarch, Nymphaea, Aisha began to earn their trust and soon became a welcome friend in their little world, always sneaking away from her royal life to see them. It was on one of her midnight visits that chaos suddenly broke out across the village. Darkar had been awakened by Bloom's return to magics and broken free of his ancient prison. He sought out the pixies and, with the help of his shadow creatures, discovered their hiding place. He drained the magic from many of the little creatures, ending their lives in the process, and kidnapped many more to feast upon later. The matriarch of the village did her best to stand up to the monster that towered before her, commanding him to leave them alone. But Darkar simply took the little pixie in his grasp, squeezed his clawed fist, and dropped her to the floor. After he returned to the streets, Aisha ran to Nymphaea's side. With the last bit of her strength, she entrusted the fairy with the power of Morphix and weakly urged her to go forth and save their people before taking her final breath. Meanwhile, a baby pixie, scared and confused, managed to hide with Aisha, and there she remained when the royal guard discovered the scene the next morning. The lake dried up and the Morphix barrier destroyed, and Princess Aisha lying unconscious amidst the rubble. After the ordeal, the king and queen sent their daughter away to Althea for protection. She would go by the name Layla and pose as the guardian fairy of Amethyst Lake, which is not real. <laughs> This way, her Morphix powers could be explained away, and she would be on a track more focused in training her to fight. Her parents were worried that Darkar would seek her out to finish her off, and felt that Althea would be the best bet for her safety. So the girls know her as Layla, a guardian fairy in some of their classes, except for Stella. As the only embodiment fairy, she's never met this person. And when she finally does, she could swear she knows her from somewhere. Stella becomes convinced that this Layla person is lying about something and is the one to call her out, fearing for the safety of her friends as Darkar grows stronger. Eventually she comes clean and tells the story of everything she's been through. This is the first time the other wings seem to really understand how dangerous of an enemy they're preparing to face and finally get Farragonda to tell them what she knows. I've always seen Aisha as the second main character of Winx. It's very clear in season one that Bloom is the protagonist, but in season two, it almost feels like they considered shifting the spotlight onto Aisha that season as the new main character. She's heavily involved in the plot and takes Bloom's spot as the newbie of the group. So for my rewrite, I like the idea of her having her own unseen story going on as we follow Bloom through most of season one. And as we head towards the finale, their stories merge. Okay, you guys, remember how I went back and redid Tecna? I changed Aisha's outfit so many times. I was texting my sister nonstop with updates to the design, trying desperately to get it to feel right. I think I'm happy with where it ended up though, thankfully. My concept was to go for a kind of meeting of swimmer and ballerina, but unfortunately those two things were for some reason a lot harder to combine than I thought they would be, and I'm still not really sure why. I thought having ribbons tied around her legs would be a good way to tie in the ballerina things, and I did like them. I liked the asymmetrical thing because, I don't know, I think it just works really well for Aisha, but again, I just didn't like the execution, I guess. I decided I had to kill my darling and get rid of them. I also thought I wanted to maybe give her tights under her skirt, but then I wanted her skirt to feel more beachy, which was such a weird combination. Ugh, it was so frustrating. Eventually, I realized I had to either lean more bathing suit or more dancewear, and I decided to choose dancewear. I know 
know that Aisha is the fairy of waves and her kingdom is half underwater, so getting rid of the beachy vibes was hard. I always thought her fairy form looked like a cool strappy bathing suit too, but in the end I figured, you know what, she's a swimmer by necessity, but she's a dancer by choice. It's what she loves and honestly probably brings her more joy than being Princess of Andros ever has, so yeah. I gave her this one sleeve wrap top, sheer shorts under her skirt, and ballet shoe inspired heels. I couldn't quite let go of the bathing suit idea though, so she has the other half of her shirt as a bikini top, and you can see the straps of her bottoms poking out from under her skirt too, which I just, I love that. I used a lot of these kind of tendrils in her outfit too as a reference to her original, and I guess trying to evoke like seaweed or, or jellyfish tentacles or something like that. It feels mermaidy to me, it feels beachy for some reason, and her original outfit is like flowy pieces of fabric. I don't know man, even after I stopped recording every change in her design, I just kept tweaking the colors and changing tiny things, there's like a million iterations. You'll see at the end I bring back the asymmetrical ribbons on her legs so that I can move her charmix up to the top of her calf. I figured it would probably hurt having a glass bottle tied to her ankle, <laughs> even though I thought it was cool that like since she's a dancer she's super flexible so she could like do a ballet pose and reach down to grab the bottle but having it on her leg is cool too. I think it's the best place for it to end up. I really struggled with Aisha's charm mix. I, I know I said I struggled with a lot of things in this video but I felt like I had sort of a, a direction for everybody else's charm mix like what kind of vessel it should be based on but for Aisha all I could think of was shell. In her first design I had it as a shell necklace as sort of a reference to Ariel and like the shell necklace from the moon movie and, and her voice and then singing and blah 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 but it was way too chunky so I think having it on her leg is good because she is a dancer and I don't know I'm just rambling at this point this this design really killed me all of the tweaks were so like minor and minuscule too like it probably doesn't look like much to you guys but to me it really mattered for some reason <laughs> I even went and adjusted the positioning of her wings at some point I will say though struggling with her charmix form has made me really excited for her enchantix. I love that look and I think it's going to be so much fun to do and hopefully not nearly as frustrating. So there we have it. The updated redesigns of our six Winx girlies are complete. I feel pretty good about them. I think I'm redeemed at least in my own eyes and please lord I hope you guys like them too. It was really fun to revisit their stories and make some updates and clarifications and at some point I'd like to do the same for the trick. I think I'll give them glue mix after all. Actually, I already have some ideas for it. Just like with the first three, I'll be adding Techna, Musa, and Flora to my big cartel as prints and stickers. And probably doing a discount for buying the whole set. I think that's a thing people do, right? It would mean so much to me if you would check it out and let me know what you think. Any and all feedback on that little shop is very much welcome. I, I still am kind of very new to it. All right, thank you so much for watching. And of course, I'll see you next time. Bye.